Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rodrigo. I'm a postdoc at the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. And today I want to discuss some results uh, which are mainly based on these two papers that I did in collaboration uh, with Benjamin Lullier, David Polarski, Armand Shafielu, and Alexei Starobinsky. So let's jump in. Um, over the last few decades, we've been building a very consistent picture of the history of the universe, which is based on the Lambda CDM uh, framework. Uh, and despite the success of this model to explain the wide variety of uh, observations, um, there are certain fundamental issues uh, that are not satisfying within this, uh, within this phenomenological model. But there is also recently many observational uh, so-called tensions. Uh, the main two examples are the H0 and S8 tensions, which are shown here on the screen. But there are also other less relevant or less statistically significant um, discrepancies within the Lambda CDM. And so um, this taken as at face value, these problems might be hinting towards the existence of, of systematics in some of the data, or possibly and more excitingly, uh, the fact that there might be some new physics that can account for such discrepancies. Um, and possibly, if you ask me, I would say that it's more likely to be a combination of both. But I believe it is important to stress that the Lambda CDM model is nothing but a collection of assumptions. And it's extremely important to rely on model independent techniques that allows us to validate such assumptions um, in order not to bias uh, our interpretation of the results. And even more now that we are reaching the era of precision cosmology. Uh, with service such as uh, DESI or Euclid uh, coming in the next few years. So let me talk a bit more about uh, data that I will be using. So I'm a member of the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, which, as you may know, is a large-scale uh, survey uh, situated in Kitt Peak, Arizona. And the key word here is spectroscopic, which means that uh, by measuring the, the spectra of millions of galaxies, we can obtain very accurate redshift estimations. And having accurate redshift estimations allows us to construct uh, very precise three-dimensional maps of the local universe. And from these maps, we can then compute uh, correlators or two-point endpoint correlation functions that we can use to constrain our theoretical models. So um, by probing the last uh, roughly 11 million years of, of the growth and expansion histories of the universe, and in particular, the dark matter to dark energy domination um, transition, we can constrain uh, the fundamental properties of these two unknown components of the universe. Now, as I said, it's really important to rely on model independent techniques, and for the purpose of this work, we are focusing on one special machine learning inspired technique, which is Gaussian process. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, the technique for those of you who don't know it. So formally speaking, uh, Gaussian process is nothing but a collection of random variables, which follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution. But um, for the purpose of this work, I want you to think of uh, GP, Gaussian process, as sampling directly the space of continuous functions without assuming any model. So what do I mean by this? If I consider a uh, given observ observable y of x, uh, we say that it's it follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, with mean zero, mean function zero, and with a specified kernel, um, which characterizes the shape of these functions. So in this particular case, I'm considering to fix the values of these hyperparameters. Uh, so these parameters will determine the, um, the deviations from the mean function, which is zero here. So you see that sigma is corresponds to the amplitude of the deviations with respect to the mean. And uh, L is the correlation length, uh, which determines how rapidly this uh, samples uh, fluctuate. Um, so if I change the value of these two hyperparameters, now shown as two different curves, you will see that I can effectively sample two different shapes of curves. 
So the red curve corresponds to uh, smaller correlation lengths, meaning that the samples will oscillate much more frequently than the ones in blue. But then the amplitude of the deviations in red is bigger than in blue. So those curves will uh, deviate much more from a zero mean function, uh, which is this parameter mu here. So if I consider several uh, values of the hyperparameters and I marginalize over them, I can effectively marginalize over the space of functions. Now, what we do in our analysis is uh, essentially to use this kind of sampling techniques to reconstruct the dark energy evolution without assuming much assumption. So throughout this work, I will only be assuming a flat FRW metric and that the universe is dominated by matter at high redshift such that I don't spoil any structure formation constraints. With respect to the data, I will mainly be using uh, BAO measurements for a DESI-like survey. Uh, in particular, um, the BAO um, measurements give me access to this combination, the A over RS, uh, and the radial mode gives me access to the combination H times RS, where RS is the sound horizon at the drag epoch. And furthermore, I can also have access to this redshift space distortion, which constrain the combination F sigma 8, where F is the growth rate of the density contrast. So in principle, if I solve for the linear uh, growth using this equation, I can compute the combination F sigma 8 defined in this equation. And then I can also use uh, my background expansion history to compute distances and compare to BAO. So how do we proceed? Uh, we will be focusing on this uh, quantity FDE, which is nothing but the normalized energy density. Um, so this is, we assume that it follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution with mean function one. Remember that this quantity within lambda CDM is simply one across the entire redshift range. And we model the correlations with this uh, kernel, as I showed before. So the idea is that we, we will be sampling the values of the hyperparameters, sigma f and OF. So for a given values of those hyperparameters, I can draw a sample from this multivariate Gaussian distribution and obtain a behavior uh, for the dark energy evolution. And now together with the value of uh, the matter density, omega m, I can essentially uh, obtain an expansion history. Uh, and then with a given expansion history in hand, I can compute distances uh, and compare these to supernovae and BAO uh, measurements of the luminosity and angular uh, diameter distances. And now if I also sample uh, sigma 80, which is the amplitude of fluctuations today. I can use the growth equation I showed earlier uh, with a given value of a given theory of gravity specified by G effective. I can compute the growth history that I use to, to compare to redshift space distortion. So what I do is that I will be sampling this four dimensional parameter space using MCMC method, and I will be maximizing this likelihood, which is simply uh, the combination of the individual chi-squares. So let me first show you the results assuming uh, GR, so general relativity. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, the expansion history, uh, if I know the matter content and a given uh, behavior for the dark energy density, I have uh, fully specified my expansion history H. So the way it's written, this FDE can be not, not only the dark energy, but also any additional exotic component that we ignore, uh, but contributes to the expansion and which do, do not scale like matter. So it's not included in this term. So um, with a given edge, then I can solve for this equation and I can use, again, uh, supernova BAO and RSD data or a Roman plus desi like survey. And I can compare the samples that I draw for FDE to the data and color coded uh, them with the value of the likelihood. So if you 
if you look uh, closely, this is the true model uh, generating my data. And those samples that follow a similar evolution for dark energy, I favor by the data, meaning that they have a high likelihood. And those values that uh, those samples that uh, do not follow a similar evolution as the fiducial value, they will be disfavored by the data. So in the long run, if I marginalize and I draw uh, thousands of sample, I can obtain essentially constraints on this reconstructed quantity. Now, I can apply all this to different dark energy models and see whether I can actually reconstruct the true dark energy evolution. Uh, so each column in this figure corresponds to a different dark energy model, which is shown as a dashed line here. Um, so the exact physics behind, behind, behind these dark energy models, it's not relevant, but I just want you to notice that my reconstructions, the meat of my reconstructions, which are solid lines and the 95 confident regions, always capture the true dark energy uh, evolution. Um, and not only that, but we can also see that in some cases, in particular, these two uh, cases, we can exclude lambda CDM, which corresponds to the FD equals one at more than two sigma. So in principle, by applying this technique, we can indeed recover the true dark energy evolution without assuming the dark energy model. And we could see in principle deviations from lambda. And as you can see, the expansion and growth histories are always very much in agreement with the fiducial uh, values that generate my mock data. And now I can go uh, and apply this to models beyond general relativity where the growth is, is modified. So um, many theories of modified gravity lead to a modified Poisson equation. Uh, so there will be this effective uh, coupling constant G effective, which can be redshift and scale dependent. And so the idea is that uh, we can apply the same procedure as we did before and model uh, the, this phenomenological uh, constant or rather function as a Gaussian processes, uh, as a Gaussian process centered around, around uh, Newton's constant. So this is what we call uh, mu. And so we assume that this follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution for very low redshift. And then at high redshift, I, I recover GR in, other, in order not to spoil BBN or CMB constraints. So we give freedom and we can explore uh, very different behaviors for this quantity mu at very low redshift where the DESI data will, will be more, uh, more uh, sensitive to these deviations from GR. So notice here that uh, above a given critical redshift ZC, I impose that all my samples uh, go back to one, uh, exactly one, and with a vanishing derivative. So we can train our GP with this condition and have smooth uh, deviations at very low redshift. And again, if you look at the different values of the hyperparameters, this essentially captures any possible deviation and any possible model around the uh, redshift zero. So by marginalizing over a large number of realizations, I can effectively uh, obtain constraints on this on this um, on this quantity G effective. So here I'm showing two phenomenological profiles which are meant to represent a large class of models. So there's no underlying theory. But you see that in both cases, in red, I recover this bump shown in dashed. And in blue, I recover this kind of uh, step-like transition to lower uh, gravity today. So not only this, but you, you see that also, um, since I am sampling these hyperparameters, which determine the shape of G-effective, and I am simultaneously sampling sigma eight zero, I can also get unbiased estimations of sigma eight zero. So in this case, my fiducial value is 0.81, and you see that I recovered this value within two sigma. And then I can, of course, look at projections uh, of these constraints 
And so you see, you first see that uh, I recover exactly the same fiducial value for the amplitude sigma eight zero without any bias. And not only that, but I can also see that uh, the projected constraints on, on mu at redshift 1.4, where the DESI measurements are most precise, you can see that uh, I can clearly see the red uh, contours is not consistent with with one. So I have this detection of a deviation from GR at more than to C. And more interestingly, um, by looking at the posterior distributions of these hyperparameters, which again determines the deviations from general relativity, you see that my value of sigma A, sigma F, which if you recall, this determines how much my samples deviate from GR. You see that the posteriors are not consistent with zero. What this means is that um, the data is requiring deviations from the mean function. If GR was a good description of the data, this posterior distribution should be consistent with vanishing values of sigma f. But because it's speaking at uh, non-vanishing values, this means that uh, the underlying theory of gravity or the mean function is not consistent with the data. And even more interesting is the fact that because ZC it's a free parameter, I can essentially constrain when this deviation happens. And you see that both posterior distribution peak at the correct redshift when, when this uh, fiducial models deviate from GR. So this brings me to my conclusions. Um, today I presented a model independent approach to jointly reconstruct both growth and expansion history, which I believe are uh, reasonable assumptions, namely a flat FRW and Einstein the Cedar at high redshift. And by applying this technique, we can actually uh, accurately reconstruct the dark energy evolution encoded in this FDE function. And also we can put constraints on deviations from GR uh, by reconstructing this G effective in a non-parametric form. Um, by doing this, we can uh, get unbiased estimations of the cosmological parameters omega m and sigma 8, which are crucial in their service, such as Euclid or Rubin and CMBS4, that will add to the constraining power. And in principle, it will help um, us to tell to test this um, the existence of new physics. So that's all I have to say. So I thank you very much for your attention and look forward for your questions.